you made it to the Go Commando Show with Fred Galvin. On our new mission, we contend with the naked truths of health, leadership, and overcoming adversity. Now, it's time to Go Commando! Good morning. This is Fred Galvin, and I have with us Dr. Peter Pry. And I'm going to let him explain a little bit about his background. Is I have recently learned something that I've had questions on my mind for several years, and it is about EMP. And he is a subject matter expert. And Dr. Pry, could you explain a little bit about your training, your education, and your background? I'm Dr. Peter Vincent Pry. I'm the chief of staff of the Congressional EMP Commission. And EMP stands for Electromagnetic Pulse. I've uh, worked in the CIA as a professional staffer on the House Armed Services Committee and served on various congressional commissions dealing with nuclear strategy and weapons of mass destruction. Uh, In fact, my whole professional life, uh, I've been dealing with uh, weapons of mass destruction, terrorism, cyber warfare, nuclear warfare. And the threat that has always worried me most is the subject matter of the commission on which I've I've, I've served, which is the electromagnetic pulse threat, you know, which is uh, the greatest threat our civilization faces, uh, not least because uh, few people even know what it is today. And I know some people have, like you mentioned, know just a little bit, and that included myself. And I knew once I heard a little bit that that was something very serious that, that threatened our society. Myself, while I was in the Marines, I used to evangelize and tell our Marines that we have kind of squandered 16 years fighting these wars, specifically 16 years in Afghanistan and a little bit less in Iraq, spending $1.8 trillion on those two wars. And meanwhile, the greater threat, instead of basically farmers using 1947 weapons in these two countries, is the threat of having what we have become dependent on all of our electricity, how we clean and, you know, everything is based on electronics in the United States now, having it shut down. And can you walk through the evolution of how this weapon became uh, brought to a capability and how it's threatening America today? Well, let me start by uh, explaining one of the reasons why people don't know about EMP, and that's because it had been deeply classified for many years. When I was at the CIA, uh, we wouldn't have been able to talk openly about what we're going to be talking about now. It was deeply classified, even among people who had clearances for nuclear weapons design and nuclear strategy. EMP was a even more classified subset of that. Uh, It wasn't until 2008 when the EMP Commission delivered its reports to Congress. And my boss, Dr. William Graham, who's the free world's foremost expert on EMP, uh, uh, decided that we needed to deliver unclassified reports. Now, we produced classified reports, too, but we delivered two unclassified reports that told more, uh, really, the, uh, all the most of the information that's out there now has been declassified by the Congressional EMP Commission because we knew uh, in the course of our research that while the bad guys, Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran, they all knew about nuclear EMP. They were all planning to use it in their war plans, but the main people, the people who didn't know about it were the American people and the uh, businesses, the utilities, people that provide electric power grid, food, banking, finance, industrial base. They didn't know about it and they weren't able to do anything to protect their systems against EMP. So we started, we wanted to educate them so that, uh, uh, so that uh, they would know what the threat is and they would understand why Congress, we hoped, was going to implement recommendations that the commission made back in 2008 that would protect our society. Perhaps I should talk about the EMP threat, you know, uh, what is an EMP before we go any further. Uh, You know, an an EMP or an electromagnetic pulse is basically a super energetic radio wave. Uh, It's got so much energy in it, this radio wave, that it can destroy electronics. Uh, It can destroy uh, any kind of electronics in the electric power grid and a radio, although it does depend upon what generates the EMP. Now, there are three uh, 
if I could expand upon that a little more yes. in terms of to understand an EMP. Um, I'm sure every member of your audience has had the experience of uh, driving down the highway, listening to the radio, and then you pass under a power line and the radio goes dead or there's static interference and you can't hear the music or whatever's on the radio anymore. Right. And then you come up on the other side of the power line and the radio is okay. Uh, you, what you've just experienced is something akin to an EMP. It's an electromagnetic magnetic field that interferes with your radio and causes the radio to be upset temporarily. Now, just imagine if that electromagnetic field were a billion times more powerful than what you encounter on the highway. And now you drive your car through that field, you'll find your radio uh, is fried by the field because it's so powerful and the car will stop because all the electronics in the car will also be destroyed. You will be unharmed because the field doesn't hurt you. It passes through your, your body harmlessly like a radio wave. But any kind of electronics in that field are going to be destroyed. Now let's imagine that that field is not just localized to that one power line, but it's a huge field and it covers North America, all 48 United States, most of Canada, and a good chunk of Mexico. And so all the electronics within that field are now at risk and can be destroyed, including power grids, airplanes fall, flying through the sky will lose their electronics and fall out of the sky, nuclear power reactors, uh, uh, you know, will uh, in seven days, you know, because they'll, they'll be off the grid and they'll run out of emergency uh, generating cap capability and their batteries end up going Fukushima and explode and spread radioactivity everywhere natural gas pipelines because the field will cause the SCADA systems that regulate the natural gas flow to spark and set the gas pipelines on fire. you get explosions and firestorms in cities and, uh, and, and, in, and in forest fires. Water will stop because you need water that comes from the electric grid. The uh, water in hydroelectric uh, in, uh, in water purification plants will backflow into lakes and rivers, polluting them even more than they are than they are now. These are some of the things that would happen. Industrial plants, uh, you know, have chemical spills, explosions, toxic clouds everywhere. And the worst thing is um, the, the threat to life from the lack of, uh, I mentioned water, but food. You know, uh, we only have enough food in the country for 30 days to fill, feed 320 million people. And it will start spoiling within 72 hours when after the EMP. You know, that's when the emergency generators will exhaust their full food supply so that the refrigerators and temperature control systems will fail in these big regional food warehouses that store our food and it will begin to spoil. That's why the EMP Commission estimates that in a year after a, a, an EMP attack or event that causes a nationwide blackout that lasts a year, we could lose something between two-thirds and 90% of our population through starvation, disease, and societal collapse. Because we're an electronic civilization, and we can't exist without electricity and electronics. And, uh, you know, when you subtract, you think of EMP, uh, an EMP as a weapon, as an anti-technology weapon. It subtracts technology from the equation of our society. And when you lose that technology, you know, you can't sustain 320 million people. That's what the number of people, you know, we have in this country now. Before there were electric grids and the modern electronic infrastructures that we have now that sustain this population, if you go back to 1900, let's say, we had fewer than 100 million people living in this country. And um, most of them were farmers. 75% of the country were farmers. And, uh, and we were the most successful nation on earth at the turn of the century in 1900, as we are today. So we had a population that was as big as you could get it for those kinds of infrastructures. You know, coal-fueled locomotives, uh, a population 75% agrarian farmers, uh, horse, hundreds of thousands of horse-drawn vehicles to deliver yes. food to market, a local market economy so that you could supply cities. And what would happen, because people find it hard to believe, well, how do you lose 90% of your population? Well, you do that because you don't have food and water when you lose the modern critical infrastructures, and there's no 19th century infrastructure to fall back on anymore. All these yes. other infrastructures I'm describing are gone with the wind. They don't exist. So how do you... We tried hard, but we couldn't figure out how to keep 320 million people alive with no food and water. Can you describe the the threat that we currently have against us what what countries have this and how 
um, with what you may be able to talk about, how they developed a, a threat against us with this uh, EMP platform. Yes, uh, we owe our our electric grid uh, more to uh, Nikolai Tesla than to Thomas Edison. He's really the one that uh, deserves more credit for inventing modern electric civilization. And it was invented in this country by Tesla. In New York State was uh, the Niagara Falls hydroelectric dam. Around the turn of the century was the first electric grid invented. And uh, and we exported the, the knowledge to the world. And we were responsible for electrifying the world. Uh, the uh, uh, it wasn't until the 1930s in the Roosevelt administration, though, that we became a true electronic civilization. That's when uh, the most electrification became uh, happened. And it is our Achilles heel. Electricity, the electronic technology that we depend upon is our Achilles heel. And uh, uh, we face uh, uh, three threats from EMP to this uh, uh, to, uh, to, to our electric grid. Uh, to this uh, Achilles heel that we have. One of them is not from man, but it's from nature. It's from the sun. Uh, we, uh, every, uh, uh, the sun causes sol superstorms, solar superstorms or geomagnetic storms that create a natural EMP that can take down electric grids. And they happen every year. Uh, uh, normal geomagnetic storms uh, raise hop with air traffic control systems and even with, and with electric grids usually with countries at high northern latitudes, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Russia. And, uh, and, and they have endeavored to protect their grids from these run-of-the-mill kinds of storms that happen all the time. Uh, every now and then you get a bigger one uh, that, uh, that uh, gives us a clue about what a, a really big one would look like. Like in 1989, there was a storm in Canada called the Hydro-Quebec storm that affected half of Canada and the New England states, and it blacked out all of Canada, uh, half of Canada in 90 seconds and destroyed a big transformer, an extra high voltage transformer uh, in, uh, in uh, I believe it was New Jersey, uh, you know, in 90 seconds melted that transformer. The transformer was designed to carry 750,000 volts and it melted in 90 seconds. It gives you an idea of the power. And that wasn't the storm we're worried about. You know, the storm we're worried about is the once in a hundred year geomagnetic superstorm like the 1859 Carrington event. I brought it with me. I don't know if it'll be visible on camera or if people yes. can see it very well, but here's a, here's a telegraph key from 1859. Uh, uh, this was the advanced electronics of its day. Uh, uh, in 1859, the colonial powers, you know, had uh, built railroads in, uh, in uh, India and in Africa and China all over the world. Uh, uh, Australia, and they had strong telegraph cables wherever there was a railroad. Uh, we had just laid the transatlantic cable in 1859 connecting the United States to Europe. And when the uh, uh, event happened, when the uh, solar superstorm happened, uh, uh, you can see what a clunky piece of electronics this is. I mean, it's a big, heavy, robust chunk of metal, yes. basically a telegraph key. And it's a billion times uh, uh, less vulnerable, a billion times less vulnerable than modern microelectronics that we have in our computers and, and uh, in our automobiles and our airplanes and everything. And yet this thing melted uh, all over the world. Telegraph keys like this were melted or they caught on fire and the telegraph wires themselves burst into flames so that there were fire, forest fires around the world. The pulse from the current event was so powerful it reached miles deep into the Atlantic Ocean and burned out the transatlantic cable that had just been laid. And the Great Eastern had to go back and, and relay that cable. Now, fortunately, we weren't an electronic civilization in 1859. Those were the horse and buggy days. And, uh, and it wasn't the end of mankind. But we fear if something like that happens again, you know, it would be the end of, uh, of uh, modern, it would be the end, perhaps the end of humankind. It would certainly be the end of electronic civilization not just in the United States, but everywhere in the world, because uh, the Carrington event was an uh, electromagnetic pulse that happened everywhere in the world. Uh, there was a lesser storm, much lesser storm, called the Railroad Storm in 1921 that just uh, uh, affected North America. And uh, it's called the Railroad Storm because the pulse coupled into the railroad tracks of North America, and it burned out all the electronics and switching yards and and uh, and places where you'd have the car switch, uh, the uh, tracks would have to switch. All those railroad 
electronics were burned out. Now, in 1921, was, we, we were still not an electronic civilization yet. And, uh, and uh, you know, but that, again, gave us another clue. The National Academy of Sciences did a study uh, that, that looked at the 1921 railroad storm. Not the Carrington event, which was 10 times more powerful, but the 20, 1921 railroad storm, and calculated that if that happened today, it would take us 10 years to recover the grid from a 1921 railroad storm, which is the same thing as saying that we would never recover from it. You know, because in one year, we would lose two thirds to 90% of our population. And there's no recovery once you lose that many people. So that's one of the big threats that we face, the threat from the sun, the natural EMP threat. The other EMP threat is from nuclear weapons. You know, the bad guys can detonate a nuclear weapon and it doesn't have to be a special nuclear weapon or a very powerful one. Any kind of a nuclear weapon will do. But uh, uh, if you detonated a nuclear weapon uh, at 300 kilometers over the center of the United States, it would put an EMP field down over North America, over Canada, 48 United States, over much of Mexico. That happens to be the altitude at which North Korea's two satellites, the KMS-3 and KMS-4, they have two satellites that orbit over us now several times a day at that altitude. And the EMP commission is very concerned that is there a nuclear weapon on those satellites? They could do that. They, they have the uh, ability to put, uh, we think the North Koreans are even able to design a super EMP weapon. Uh, they tested a hydrogen bomb on September 3rd and declared it capable of, be, of super powerful EMP attack. And four days, uh, a couple days after that, on September 4th, they released a technical report that accurately described a super EMP weapon. That's a specialized nuclear weapon to make extraordinarily powerful EMP fields. And it can be small. A weapon like that can be small and it could fit in those satellites. So, uh, you know, we're very concerned that North Korea might have satellites orbiting over us over now. We recommend those satellites be at least investigated to find out if they are nuclear armed and, uh, and uh, preferably they just shot down, shoot them down over a broad ocean area, over one of the poles, so that so, because it should be intolerable for for a, for the, a potential North Korean threat to be literally hanging over our heads like a sort of Damocles several times a day, um, uh, so that's another threat. Uh, you don't need to do it by missile. Uh, you and it doesn't have to be as high as three hundred kilometers. Uh, if terrorists got the, got hold of a nuclear weapon, and a Scud missile, uh, you know they could fire it off a freighter. Or they could use a meteorological balloon to loft the warhead to an altitude of just 30 kilometers anywhere over the eastern part of the United States. And that alone would doom us as a civilization, a meteorological balloon carrying a nuclear weapon at 30 kilometers altitude. Because the field on the ground will reach out to 600 kilometers. Now that won't cover the whole east coast, but it's enough to destroy the eastern grid. We have three grids in our society the Eastern grid, the Western grid, and the Texas grid. And if they just took out the Eastern grid, we couldn't survive without that. That generates 75% of our electricity and it supports most of our population. Uh, so this is, uh, an, it's the easiest kind of a nuclear attack to do because you don't need a re-entry vehicle. It doesn't have to be accurate. You can deliver it by all kinds of means. You could use a satellite, you could use an ICBM, you could use a balloon, you could use a a, a private jet doing a zoom climb to get the thing above 30 kilometers. And I should add, when the EMP attack happens, it's it's not like a normal nuclear attack that most people think of when you let a nuclear weapon go off in a city. There's no blast. You know, it's happening in the vacuum of space, even at 30 kilometers. That's up above the atmosphere. So there's uh, it's basically detonating in the vacuum of space. There's no radiation, there's no fallout, there's no thermal effects, there's no blast. If you were standing on the ground, you know, and 30 mile, uh, kilometers above your head, the weapon went off, you wouldn't even hear it, you know, because there's no atmosphere for it to make noise. It's going off silently. Um, you would only know that you were under attack when you found your car wouldn't start. You can't use the telephone. There's no water. That Suddenly all the electronics have failed. And now you find yourself you know, without your electronic civilization that supports your life, and you've got to find a way to live without all of that. Um, now, there's another kind of an EMP attack. We've talked about the threat from nature, from the sun. We've talked about the nuclear EMP threat. The third EMP threat is from non-nuclear EMP weapons called radio frequency weapons. And uh, these are uh, 
they uh, the radius of effect for a radio frequency weapon is uh, much shorter than for nuclear. It's rare, rarely more than a kilometer. And uh, 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 but you could end a civilization with just an attack by non-nuclear EMP weapons. That's because the electric grid is so fragile. Uh, uh, and there was a Wall Street Journal report uh, on a study done by the U.S. Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, purportedly a cl classified study, uh, that uh, found that if the bad guys knew which nine EHV transformer substations to attack, nine out of 2,000, okay, if you hit the right nine, or if you hit, you know, a random number, you know, and, and the nine were included among them, or, you know, that you would basically cause a cascading failure through the nation, na whole national electric grid that would cause a nationwide blackout that would last more than a year. And again, so any one of these things could end our civilization from the sun, from a nuclear AMP attack, the radio frequency weapon by itself. Cyber attacks could be used to attack the grid. And, and cause a nationwide blackout, uh, or physical sabotage. You know, if you knew which nine transformers to attack, you could use a high-powered rifle or rocket-propelled grenade launcher. And the bad guys plan to use all of these uh, in their new strategy, their revolution in military affairs. They consider it the greatest revolution in military affairs in history. They plan to use all these things in combination, cyber attacks, physical sabotage, non-nuclear EMP weapons and nuclear EMP attack as well. Why? Why would they do all of these when you can achieve it with just one? For the same reason that Nazi Germany, when they developed the Blitzkrieg, uh, although they had superior tanks and superior aircraft and superior infantry because they were all mobilized, any one of which could have enabled them to basically beat the Western democracies at that time, early on in the war, they understood that there's a synergism that comes from the yes. combining these superior firepower effects. And there's even a, ma a, a mathematical equation for it called, you know, n to the square power. You know, every time you add an increment of fire, the advantage goes up. Not It's not additive, but it's exponential to the, yes. it's to the square power. And so, uh, uh, in effect, so when you've got four ways of taking down the grid and use all four, uh, the the uh, it's uh, the improvement in your firepower, the likelihood, uh, the improvement of your firepower is not a fourfold advantage, but it's a sixteenfold advantage, a sixteenfold increase in likelihood that you can succeed in your mission and overwhelm the adversary, and that's why they have they they plan it. and any any military planner would do it that way, you know uh, this. Uh, equation called the, the Lanchester Square equation. It's been around since before World War I. And the North Koreans know about it. Everybody knows about it. Anybody, and it's just common sense. When you're trying to take out the world's only superpower, or at least that's what we call ourselves, uh, you want to throw in the kitchen sink and do everything possible right. to win. You know, because uh, if you fail, you're gonna, your country will be, the retaliatory strike will turn you into a plate of glass. One last comment I'd like, uh, you know, to make uh, before turning it back to you, uh, is uh, people say, well, we don't have to worry about this because deterrence worked during the Cold War against the Soviet Union that had, you know, thousands of nuclear weapons. And it's going to work again against North Korea or against Iran or against Russia and China. It'll work again. So we can sleep well at night because deterrence will work and they'll never attack us. That is a real dangerous attitude. And um, uh, and it's a typically American attitude. You know, our in addition to our electric grid being one of our Achilles heel, we have a uh, there's a psychological vulnerability that America in particular has that is potentially even more dangerous. You know, uh, if, if the Russians are dysfunctionally paranoid because they th see threats everywhere, we are dysfunctionally optimistic as a people. Yes, we always look on the bright side. Always. There's always a reason to not worry about some threat and, and so that we can sleep well at night. And that's how World Wars I one, one happened. That's how World War II happened. You know, uh, it's an old story about this unlimited faith in deterrence and the failure of deterrence. Look at every war that's ever been fought in history is a case study 
in the failure of deterrence, all yes. right? How many wars have there been in history? That's how many times deterrence has failed, you know? We still have people living today who have experienced the fa- I met some of them yesterday, as did you, at this yes. National Security Summit we were at, who lived through World War II, and they had seen, uh, you know, a war happen that was the greatest war in human history up to that point, 60 million people di- dead, because deterrence failed. It didn't, it didn't work. Um, and this concept, people act like, I was talking to some reporter yesterday who was making this very argument that, oh, we don't have to worry about nuclear North Korea because uh, uh, even though the, uh, people who were disagreeing with me that he was interviewing had no expertise on EMP or nuclear weapons, they were experts in game theory, okay? And according to game theory, they should be deterred, okay? All, all right? These are people, these people who are experts in game theory need to read a couple of history books, all right? Uh, exactly. uh, before the, the, the concept of deterrence has been around with us as long as history. And, uh, but, and the same concepts, just as sophisticated as the people who, uh, who uh, uh, engage in game theory today and, and, and use it as some kind of a magic wand to reassure us that wars will not happen. Uh, there was a guy before World War I called, called Norman Angel, and he wrote a book called... Uh, the, the Great Illusion, and it was a bestseller, and the, and the elites of the Western democracies bought it, and he was a uh, 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 he was a, a, a very popular speaker at universities and before Parliament and all this. Norman Angel, and his theory was uh, that we had seen the end of wars, of great wars in Europe. Uh, the, the book was published in 1910, and and the reason for that was because the economies of Europe. He proved it mathematically. The economies of Europe had become so integrated and they were so dependent on each other that if there was another great war, it would be a net economic loss for all the nations involved. So no rational actor would ever go to war. So hallelujah, we don't need to spend money. uh, We can abandon this arms race that was going on with Germany. At the time, Britain and and, and Germany were locked in a great naval arms race trying to build more battleships than each other. The ICBMs and nuclear weapons of their day. And four years later, you know, Norman Angel proved to be catastrophically wrong because we had one of the greatest war in history up to that time. Yes. Uh, you know, and he was right about the economic losses. It destroyed Europe. But the point is, nations go to war for other reasons than, than, than economic interests. You know, uh, that's another thing that we have a, 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 a failing that we have as a democracy because we always think in terms of dollars and cents. Our elites think in terms of dollars and cents. They can't get their minds around it ideological reasons to go to war, going to war for purposes of honor and, uh, right. and, and, and nationalism, going to war because you're paranoid for psychological reasons and you think you've got to strike before the other guy does, which is basically what happened in World War I. I won't get into the details of why Norman Angel proved to be catastrophically wrong, but he was. And it happened again before World War II. You know, the generation that lived before World War II had experienced World War I, and most of them couldn't imagine that any rational actor, including Adolf Hitler and Tojo in Japan, that anyone uh, uh, would would dare risk another world war. And so for that reason, the Western democracies neglected their defenses again because a war wasn't going to happen. There were only a handful of lonely voices, guys like Winston Churchill, you know, who uh, listened to Hitler and paid attention to what the Japanese were doing and said, you know, not only are these guys planning to go to war again, you know, to reverse the outcome of World War One, But they've come up with a re- new revolution in military affairs called the Blitzkrieg. They're going to fight a war very differently. Yes. You know, the Japanese are working on this idea about using aircraft carriers, you know, uh, so that the battleship isn't going to be the queen of uh, uh, of the chessboard anymore. And, uh, and uh, the Nazis are working on uh, this Blitzkrieg that you know, combines uh, armor with air power and mobilized infantry uh, you know, that, uh, that can have decisive effects. And and because of a failure of strategic imagination, they laughed at Churchill. I mean, he was mocked. Uh, the people who uh, uh, surrounded him were mocked. And uh, and uh, uh, they had faith in Neville Chamberlain that you could negotiate with Hitler. Hitler wasn't a monster that Churchill was telling us. Uh, Here's a man we can reason with. And so when he came back from, you know, Czechoslovakia, it was peace in our time, according to Chamberlain. And, 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 and a year later, we were in World War II. Uh, 
and, uh, and 60 million de- people died. 60 million people died because of a failure of strategic imagination, because of a failure to understand that deterrence fails. Yes. All right? Now, I lived through the Cold War, okay? The, I can hear my this correspondent that was interviewing me yesterday already disagreeing by saying something like, well, nuclear weapons changed all that. Nuclear weapons changed the world, and so, you know, so deterrence will work because it worked during the Cold War. You know, I was at the CIA, you know, during a, probably the worst time of the Cold War, or the most interesting time of the Cold War anyway, from 1985 to 1995. I was there at the height of Soviet power, and then I saw the aftermath when the Soviet Union collapsed and it turned into Russia. And before I was there, and while I was there, there were a number of close calls People don't know how close we came to a nuclear war. It's a miracle that we did uh, that that uh, that uh, that uh, deterrence didn't fail, and uh, that we didn't end up with a nuclear war in uh, 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 with the uh, with with the Soviet Union. And by the way, one of these things people fail to understand is uh, there were a lot of wars during the Cold War, and millions of people died from those wars. Yes. And and the great strategist Colin S. Gray is absolutely right when he says that these wars were nuclear wars, all right? The Vietnam War was a nuclear war. The uh, uh, the uh, wars in Africa were a nuclear war. The, all the Middle Eastern wars were a nuclear war. Why is that? You know, even though the, a nuclear war weapon was not actually detonated in any of those wars, all of the decision makers you know, all uh, on both sides knew that nuclear weapons existed, and they and they were important factors in the mental geography of those wars. The decisions that were made they were ended up being crucial in in in, in the decisions that were made in some of those wars. You know, a lot of people still don't understand to the, to this day that one of the reasons we lost the Vietnam War, you know, was because uh, China was a nuclear weapons state, and so was Russia, and uh, and Lyndon Johnson. Uh, would not invade North Vietnam, which was the necessary thing to do. He had to invade North Vietnam and occupy North Vietnam in order to win that war. But he wouldn't do it because he was afraid that it would lead to Chinese intervention and then nuclear escalation. And uh, I had, when I was in graduate school, there was a guy named, he, he's passed away now, his name was uh, Roger Swearingen, Professor Roger Swearingen. He was an advisor to Lyndon Baines Johnson, and he told us, uh, about how he had a conversation with the president, President Johnson. Why won't you go into North Vietnam, sir? It's the only way, you know, to win. And Johnson wouldn't do it because of the fear of the nuclear threat. Uh, all the wars we have fought, you know, have been overshadowed by the fact of the existence of nuclear weapons. So they did influence uh, 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 every decision to go to war. The fact that we decided to fight the communists in North Vietnam who were allied to the Russians, you know, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it didn't stop the violence from happening. And those, that Cold War period, there were a dozen times that, uh, that it nearly turned into an all-out nuclear war. Uh, and it was just by the grace of God that it didn't happen. And by the fact that we went to extraordinary measures to prevent it from happening, you know, you know, we, we, we uh, tr- tried to match the Russians and the, the Soviets weapon for weapon. We studied our strategic and military posture and looked for our vulnerabilities and wouldn't tolerate those vulnerabilities. You know, if they tried to get around us by deploying tactical nuclear weapons, we deploy tactical nuclear weapons to balance it. At one point, they introduced a whole new kind of nuclear missile, an intermediate range nuclear missile, to try to decouple us from our NATO allies. And we started deploying intermediate range nuclear missiles to, to, to block that move. Even uh, during that time, we had a population back in the United States that took preparations for dealing with nuclear war, which now is completely disregarded and most people would think would be foolish. That's right. It's a countermeasure. And <clears throat> what are the countermeasures that... Uh, let, let, let me just sure. complete my thought, if you, if you don't mind. We, we read every, we, every book we could get our hands on that the Russian general staff wrote about nuclear war and how to prosecute war. We translated it, read it, studied it. We looked at their exercises, did everything we could to understand their minds. And after doing all of that, at least 12 times, we almost ended up getting a nuclear war anyway, and deterrence came so close to failing. Now, all right, in the end, it did work, but only as a result of extraordinary effort and only because the evil empire collapsed of its own weight. 
You know, yeah. another miracle was that they went down and didn't want to drag. And they almost did try to drag us down. In 1991, when the Soviet Union was collapsing, the general staff and the KGB did a coup against Gorbachev. We happened to get really lucky in that we got a, a very humanitarian leader of the Soviet Union, was their last leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, who didn't want to push the button and bring us down. Okay, so they did a coup against them because they didn't want the Soviet Union to collapse. And they actually put their strategic forces on readiness, on ready for a nuclear war. But fortunately, the good guys in Russia, the ones who wanted a dem democratic future for Russia, won over the bad guys. And that's the only reason I've written about this, uh, these things in a book I've written called War Scare that describes a number of the nuclear close calls we had with Russia. Bottom line here is the Cold War is no good paradigm for survival. I don't want my grandchildren living under the paradigm of a new Cold War with North Korea uh, and Russia and China. Now think of our relationship with North Korea. You know how many Americans know how to speak Korean? Uh, you know we don't. Need, do we have their books on how they plan to fight a war? Uh, we haven't done our job. You know, we haven't. We 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 don't even have the people who know how to think the way they do and translate their stuff. Right. They're a black box to us. Much harder intelligence target than the Russians ever were, and so you don't have the right. And I don't say you, but I'm talking about people like this radio guy that was interviewing me yesterday, or actually was a journalist, to to simply lazily say back, lay back and say, well. Deterrence worked in the Cold War, so it's going to work against North Korea. Deter we, you've got to earn yes. the, the making deterrence work by doing the hard work of protecting yourself. And deterrence isn't going to work if you leave an obvious vulnerability like the electric grid wide open. And uh, But anyway, that's a, 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 I'll owe over to you again. I, I'm sorry for yes. dominating, for taking so long on, on my soapbox here. So a lot of people want to believe that right now America is safe. That That is a common thing because it does make people sleep better at night. And, you know, even though that Kim Jong-un is, you know, demonstrating and provoking and a lot of people think, you know, earlier in the spring and summer, he was launching missiles that would blow up. And, you know, I was under the understanding that those can get more than 20, a couple dozen miles downrange. Uh, they're, likely detonating those on their own. And, you know, just the effects of having lived in Asia while I was in the military for, you know, six years, knowing what it would do if a city like Seoul or North or uh, Tokyo was destroyed. But, you know, now we have something far greater, a threat to the United States. And that is, you know, whether it's, and if you can get into the details of how North Korea is basically you know, a proxy for some of these other countries that want to remain neutral, but they are providing parts as North Korea has to Syria and other places in the world. Uh, but how some people were made fun of, uh, mainly President Bush Jr. calling this axis of evil, but this is actually what has been going on in a country like North Korea that's very poor and starving. Well, how can they develop this as you, and if you can elaborate, I mean, they have this, it's not, it's no longer in the bag that they may have or in a number of years, it's present day today, they have a capability that is capable of creating mass destruction in America. And how has that been supplied by other countries? Yes, the American people have been so poorly uh, uh, misinformed by the press and by uh, uh, the Obama administration, when they were the political leadership, and even even the current administration, frankly, uh, 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 people who follow this closely uh, understand this now. But I sometimes forget that people don't understand that North Korea actually is now a bona fide nuclear weapons state that can strike the United States of America. And our intelligence community did not have this view just uh, six months ago. Just six months ago, the the view was uh, that uh, uh, North Korea might not even have ICBMs, that the ICBMs that we were having in parades might be fakes. Uh, that was a minority view, but a lot of people in academia certainly believed that and wrote about it. And uh, in the intelligence community, uh, the view was, well, if, if the missiles aren't fakes, 
you know, they don't work very well. And the first, the furthest they could probably reach would be Alaska and Hawaii, but not the mainland the United States. They also were arguing that even if they could reach Alaska and Hawaii, we wouldn't have to worry that much about it because they haven't mastered the ability to miniaturize a warhead, that is, to make the warhead small enough to fit it in, inside of a missile, which is really a nonsense argument, but I, I won't get into a digression, uh, digression there. That was a phony argument that the Obama administration m m made up so they wouldn't have to uh, uh, acknowledge that North Korea had become a nuclear weapon state on their watch, this notion of warhead miniaturization. Uh, the, uh, uh, and that they didn't have reentry vehicles that could enter, penetrate the atmosphere. Another not, nonsensical kind of an argument. If you can build a hydrogen bomb, uh, if you can build an atomic bomb, which they clearly have done, they've tested, tested them six times, and you can make a long-range missile, miniaturizing a warhead and making a reentry vehicle is child's play compared to those technological challenges. Uh, and uh, they also were saying six months ago that uh, uh, it would be years that North Korea might never be able to get a hydrogen bomb. And if they ever did, it would be years in the future before a backward country like North Korea could develop a hydrogen bomb. Well, this six months, in, well, six months later, the view is completely reversed and, uh, and not from brilliant analysis by the intelligence community, but this summer, the summer that has just passed, you know, has proven them wrong on every point. The North Koreans, that have, in effect, have done tests that have proven them wrong at every point. They've demonstrated they've got reliable ICBMs that have a range uh, uh, that could reach at least as far as Denver and Chicago, the mainland the United States, probably the entire United States. The, uh, 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 they've demonstrated that they have reentry vehicles. Uh, we, we now assess that they do have miniaturized warheads on their ICBMs already so that they've been able to strike us you know, all along. And then they successfully tested a hydrogen bomb as I mentioned yes. earlier in this broadcast, so they actually have a fully-fledged two-stage hydrogen bomb. And the EMP Commission had been warning, by the way, we're the only organization that had it all right. We were telling everybody about these things, including that they had super EMP weapons. And uh, the North Koreans, as I said, described this hydrogen bomb as capable of super powerful EMP attack, and they also released a technical report that accurately describes a super EMP weapon. So they... Uh, our intelligence community ended up being catastrophically wrong, and it's really disgraceful uh, when Kim Jong-un is actually telling the truth. And if you had just listened to what Kim Jong-un was saying for these past several years, you'd have a much more accurate assessment of what their nuclear missile capabilities were than if you listened to the, uh, to the U.S. intelligence community. Now, uh, how did the North Koreans get these capabilities? The reason I think that our intelligence community has been surprised is twofold. First, they've been deeply politicized. They're not, the, our best and brightest are not working uh, in our intelligence community. You know, the Obama administration, I think, was the uh, most ferocious administration ever when it came to firing analysts who disagreed with them. They even fired General Flynn. He was the director of DIA before he went to right. work for Trump. You know, they fired the man because he didn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't produce politically correct intelligence. He, right. would, he, want, he was trying to tell them the truth. And they didn't want to hear it, so they fired yes. the director of DIA. So if they're going to fire the director of DIA, just imagine the fate of all those lying analysts beneath him. You know, yes. if you're working in the CIA or DIA, obviously, you know, you'd get retrained. Uh, if you're telling them, look, at, we're wrong. They, they've got, they're working on a hydrogen bomb. They're almost there. If you're some, saying that, and the Obama administration doesn't want to hear it, they're going to take you off of nuclear weapons and retrain you to uh, be an economist and sh ship you off to Indonesia to count rubber plants. That's the kind of thing. And that almost happened to me under Bill Clinton's CIA, by the way. Right. <laughs> it almost actually happened to me because I wouldn't tell them the lies that they wanted to hear about the Russian nuclear threat that still existed at the end of the Cold War. Fortunately, it didn't happen. Other pretty powerful friends in the CIA intervened and saved me, but they wanted to retrain me right. as an economist and send me to Indonesia, literally, to count rubber plants oh. because I wouldn't tell the Clinton administration what they wanted to hear. And that, I'm promising you, is the kind of thing that happened, is it happened during the Obama administration. So we have the worst kind of analysts who are willing to to be bait whores, to be honest, you know, yes. they'll, 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 they'll betray their country for a dollar. And, 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 uh, and that's why they got it all, got it so wrong. It's not that the North Koreans were so clever, but there's another reason. 
uh, uh, you know, and, and why would the Obama administration want to politicize intelligence that way before I get to the other reason? And, and it's because, obviously, same reason Bill Clinton didn't want to acknowledge that, uh, that North Korea, uh, you know, had acquired the bomb on his watch. You know, uh, Obama didn't want to admit that North Korea could now reach the United States with that bomb yes. and pose an existential threat to the American people on his watch. He right. wanted to kick the can down the road to the next president, just the way Bill Clinton successfully did, because the press let Clinton get away with everything, just the way they let Obama get away with everything. But there is another reason, an analytical reason, why I believe they've been so profoundly wrong about North Korea, and why I think they're wrong about Iran, too, by the way. Uh, and that is... Their paradigm for analyzing the North Korean nuclear missile threat has, has been uh, what, they, what we call uh, that North Korea has to rely on its indigenous capabilities. That is to say, they assume that North Korea is all on its own, it's not getting help from the outside, and, uh, and so their estimates of what the North Korean capabilities are limited to what we know about North Korea's own domestic capabilities. And that has been patently untrue with anybody with eyes to see. You know, uh, to just give you some examples of some of the glaring examples of Russian and Chinese help to the North Korean nuclear missile program. Uh, you know, one of the things that happened was uh, uh, Russia sold a dozen of their Gulf class uh, ballistic missile submarines to North Korea, including an SSN-6 missile that had intercontinental range that's designed to be fired off of the Gulf ballistic missile submarine. Now, it didn't have a nuclear weapon on it. And the Russian ex explanation for this to the Depart State Department was, don't worry, we're selling it to them for scrap. <laughs> and you, can you believe sure. it? We believed that. Yes. And, uh, you know, we took their word for it and didn't object. It was a violation of the missile technology control regime. But basically, uh, that's why North Korea now today has a ballistic missile submarine that can fire a missile. You know, they were supposed to never be able to develop that capability, but they, you know, reverse engineered the Russian stuff and all of their, their ICBMs have been basically based on improvements of the SSN-6 that the Russians originally gave them. And they've been getting better at better. And additionally, the EMP commission was told, and we, and they won't, wouldn't listen to us. They obviously didn't listen to us, but back in 2004, we were demarched by two Russian generals, uh, you know, came to us and said, you know, we're sorry to have to tell you this, EMP Commission, but the design for our super EMP warhead has accidentally leaked to the North Koreans. And while we didn't do it on purpose, you know, because the Russian economy is in bad shape, some of our nuclear scientists and missile scientists have gone to North Korea, you know, for better jobs and get paid. And so we just want to tell you this because we think in a, in a couple of years, the North Koreans might be able to develop a super EMP weapon we want you to know it's not our fault, all right? But this is something that's on your horizon. And two years after that, right on the money, is when they did their first nuclear test and the world, uh, 2006, and the, the world declared it was a failed nuclear test because the yield was so low. But the profile, the seismic profile of that test is exactly what you'd expect from a super EMP weapon. It's not designed to make a big explosion. It puts out gamma rays, you know? And, uh, you know, so the, you would get this sizzle, sizzle in, the seismic, in the seismic signal. And most of their early tests were in that same yield range, less than 10 kilotons, you know. And everybody was saying, oh, the North Koreans are ha having a hard time making the bomb, which is totally unbelievable. I mean, the United States, when we had the Manhattan Project, and we only had 1930s and 1940s era technology to work with, and, and the bomb was only the glimmer in Albert Einstein's eyes, you know, we didn't, ever have, we didn't have any failure. I mean, both of our test weapons worked successfully. We didn't even test the Hiroshima bomb. I mean, it worked on that. So the idea that the North Koreans would be so incompetent that they would have to do several tests to get a bomb to work is ridiculous. And they, whatever the weapon was, they were happy with it because they immediately started weaponizing it and putting, on, putting it on their Nodong missile. So uh, uh, on top of that, and the Chinese have been helping them too. Uh, you know, we have been pulling fishing North Korean boosters uh, out of the sea uh, and defining uh, components in there that have come to them from China and from Western Europe too, through Chinese front companies mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, all the transporter erector launchers that launch the uh, North Korean ICBMs, because these are mobile ICBMs. I have to comment on that too, by the way. Mobile ICBMs in North Korea. You know, the United States doesn't have a mobile ICBM. 
Right. Well, there's only three countries in the world that have got mobile ICBMs, Russia, China, and North Korea, all right? But these TELs, which are very sophisticated, they're not just a truck. I mean, they're a huge vehicle right. that has to carry this very heavy intercontinental ballistic missile that weighs many tons, yes. and uh, and they have to be able to level it and, uh, and, and know where it is in space. It's got GPS systems on it, you know, because you've got to know where you're launching from in order to maintain the accuracy. And it's basically a mobile launch control center for a missile, okay? Highly sophisticated piece of equipment. And uh, in the parade, one of the parades the North Koreans did with their, with their TELs, uh, they forgot to take the logo off of the Chinese factory where these things are made. These TELs are, are, are provided by China. And uh, it's just so obvious right. that they didn't even scrape the logo off uh, accidentally in, in, one, uh, in one, one case. So the Chinese and the Russians have, have cl clearly been helping them. And, uh, uh, and it's, ob uh, well, it should be obvious, okay? But our intel guys don't get it. Our State Department still doesn't get it. And I'm sorry to say even President Trump has, isn't, isn't getting it yet. You know, because we think we're still pursuing this failed policy. For 25 years, we've been trying to go to China to get China to, uh, to agree to, uh, uh, to pressure North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons. But China and Russia are part of the problem. The reason North Korea has got these right. nuclear missiles is because China wants them to have them. Yes, Russia yeah. wants them to have them. They're not going to make yeah. North Korea give up these nuclear missiles. And common sense can tell you that, uh, you know, that there's a conspiracy going on here between North Korea, Russia, and China, because the North Koreans never threaten Russia and China. They only threaten us and, and, and our allies. Why is that, that, uh, you know, that the North Koreans threaten Russia and China? Even when the Chinese in public agree to enforce sanctions and the Russians publicly agree to enforce sanctions and say bad things, you know, uh, pro forma things in the United yes. States, the North Koreans never, never threaten them, okay? Because they know they're their friends. And this is all BS. That's being done for public for right. public consumption. So why would the Russians and the North Koreans, you know, there's a lot more at stake here than North Korea and even the security of South Korea and Japan. You know what this is is this is the uh, new Cold War that's being waged against us by I'm Russia sorry. and China and North Korea is an ally and Iran is an ally too. Yeah, North Korea uh, they want to be able to fight a nuclear war against the United States by surrogate. You yes. know, by proxy through North Korea, that's a risk-free way for them to take us out if they have to do it. But they want to win without war. Okay, that's the and Sun Tzu. That's the ultimate, the best kind of yes. victory is to be able to win without war. If they have to go to war, they'll do that yes. too. But how would you win without war? By raising the stakes so high, by making it so dangerous for us to provide our security guarantees to our allies in the Pacific. You know, by making this threat raising this threat in North Korea that's so scary that we're going to back out and we're going to, and our allies are going to back out. Our allies are going to say to themselves, you know, we can't really trust the United States to provide for our security anymore. You know, will the United States really go to nuclear war with North Korea and risk its own existence or risk its own cities? Will the United States be willing to trade Los Angeles and Chicago to protect Seoul and Tokyo? And they're going to say to them, no, that doesn't make sense. And uh, so we need to come up with some other way to provide our security. We can't depend on the United States anymore. Yes. And the United States is going to be asking the same, itself the same question. You know, going to say, look, at, you know, we've been spending our lives and putting our people at risk here for decades. And the Japanese and the North Korea, South Koreans haven't done what's necessary to stop North Korea. You know, they're kind of responsible for this situation arising. And now I have to take the hit. I have to put my people at risk because right. because they were not willing to act, you know, yes. when, when uh, you know, earlier, de uh, you know, maybe a decade ago yes. and when, when it would have, we could have stopped this program risk free. And, uh, and I'm, uh, my first obligation <clears throat> is to the security of the American people. You know, how, how can I justifiably under the constitution, put them at risk, you know, in order to pr underwrite the security yes. of Tokyo and Seoul. So, and we see this dilemma. I mean, we're papering it over with rhetoric and stuff, but this is going on already. It really it's working in terms of driving a wedge between right. uh, between but between our allies. And so, uh, if if this works in the Pacific, it will also work in Europe. It will yes. work again with the Iran nuclear yes. threat, which I think is the next shoe that's going to when our intelligence community is going to be surprised again 
because I think they've already got the bomb and they've already got nuclear armed missiles and they're going to be able to do the same thing with these satellites. By the way, North Korea and Iran are strategic partners and they trade technology yes. and they're North Koreans in Iran helping them with their nuclear missile program. So this is a way to get America to back off all over the world and basically destroy the existing world order that is all built on the on U.S. security guarantees and the reliance on the United States as being the global policeman. What Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran want to do in this new Cold War that we don't even know is going on yet. It's like right. before 9-11. We don't know we're in a global war with terrorism, but only a handful of us see right now that, uh, that we are in this new Cold War. And, uh, you know, what they want to do is they want to intimidate the blackmail and, and intimidate the global policemen that's the United States to back off, to stop patrolling yes. the neighborhood, to stay home, right. go home, America, and, and hide in Fortress America because we're coming after you. And uh, and uh, and if we're not willing to do that, they're they're willing to kill the global policemen. They're gonna they're gonna use their surrogates, North Korea or Iran, to shoot us, uh, uh, and to get in a war. Uh, you know to to end that. Uh, and if I could just explain yes. how that would work. <clears throat> Because Russia and China can't lose a nuclear war that happens between North Korea and the United States. You know, no, no they can't lose. You know, if, if uh, we might turn North Korea into a plate of glass, but our allies are going to be hurt really badly. You know, uh, even, if, uh, even if they don't get one nuke off, you know, the conventional capabilities of North Korea to do damage against Japan and, uh, and, and South Korea are enormous. And they probably would be able to get a couple of nukes off, at least against our, our, our regional uh, allies. The whole reason in all of our alliance systems, both in, in Pacific, in Europe, and in the Middle East, are based on the, on the idea of deterrence working, always working, so that we don't have a war and that American strength will keep the peace. Yes. In a, and when that fails, I believe the cost will be so great uh, and the, the loss of one city would be too great a cost, I think, in the view of the, of the, of the Japanese and the South Koreans. And uh, they're going to say, this is the price we're paying to be, remain aligned yes. with the United States. They will then conclude that their security is better served by realigning with China and Russia with this new coalition. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and this is what... This, it signifies when you see the leaders of South Korea and Japan trying to get friendly with Putin and the Chinese, right. Netanyahu going to Moscow, trying to get friendly with the Russians, yes. uh, you know, and the same thing with their European allies, you know, uh, trying to uh, cozy up with the Russians. They want to have it both ways. Well, still, obviously, they're relying on us as our primary ally. But these are the, these are the, uh, the cracks in the, uh, in the relationship, uh, you know. That the uh, that the axis of evil, the new axis of evil, yes. Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea are hoping will open up into Grand Canyon-sized chasms, so that they can basically win the the Cold War potentially yes. w without firing a shot uh, themselves, yes. uh, but to do it by by proxy, uh, perhaps ideally would do it without war at all, just by black blackmail. But if necessary, if necessary, by uh, by actually having having a war that gets yes. engineered, and if it actually becomes ultimately necessary, I believe they will resort. You know, they'll they come in with their own forces in in the end to to finally finish the job. Yes. Okay, you know, a lot of Americans think that because we're so, <clears throat> as you mentioned with Europe in the previous wars, that we're so interconnected, and China depends on us, and and we are. No one who's studied history is going to. Debate. I mean, you can look at a in our civil war how France and Europe were looking to reinforce possibly the South based on Lee's decision and what was going on when he pushed into Maryland. But you know, this has gone on through history, and right now I think we have a crisis in our national leadership of two things for the past several decades of no backbone, and then just. Being, as my grandfather would say, being so open-minded, we lost our brains. Um, right. But right now, so many people that uh, you know, I talked to and went to school with, you know, they have these ideas that China, even in my graduate school, we even went to China, and then, you know, everybody wants to believe and feel comfortable that 
China is so connected to us, but in the reality, if a, a weapon were detonated by a proxy like North Korea over the United States and it was reinforced using all four, those those quad strikes went into effect. And, and we know from, you know, our military plans against the North Koreans, they have a massive amount of special operations forces that target critical infrastructure. And when weapons, you know, follow a potential natural disaster that stresses our system, like we've seen before in the United States in recent years out in California, and then, you know, attacks could occur through an EMP along with, you know, attacking other grids, you know, that could present the problem that, you know, 90% of our population may die. We could get overran and China has our resources. You know, they can just rebuild using a lot of our, you know, land and resources that still function. They just have to build, rebuild the grid. Uh, but, you know, as we've seen in China, you know, they have a lot of problems of their own, not being able to sustain with their own resources and a, a large growing population. And, you know, not only as you just mentioned with the United States, but that, that can be done to threaten the whole globe. Yes. And I think it's being done for that, for that purpose. This is the, uh, uh, the first step in that direction toward a global war. Yes. And, uh, in fact, we are in a global war now. We just don't know it. The cyber attacks that are happening. I mean, that's part oh, yes. of the, uh, that's part of this, of this new way of warfare that I've been talking about. Uh, you know, ultimately if China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, you know, had to, uh, had to go, uh, to an all out war with, with us, we would see all of these forces used in combination, as we've been discussing. Yes. But what I think we're seeing now, uh, uh, an evidence of this new way of warfare always already being upon us, and the fact that we are in this global conflict, uh, you know, are the are these cyber attacks that are hitting us and our allies? Uh, they've been escalating rapidly over the years, where they started off being against this few countries, and now almost every country in the world, uh, except the bad guys. You know, are being hit with these uh, with, with, with with these attacks, and most recently, uh, analysis indicates that uh, uh, I think the latest attack that hit almost every country in the world what did come out of North Korea. I think we're going to find that we've been underestimating the North Korean cyber capabilities. I think the Chinese and the Russians, uh, and just as they have provided uh, the North Koreans with technology for nuclear missiles and EMP weapons, they've also been providing them with technology and and, and competencies for uh for cyber warfare and uh, uh i think just as they are putting us under strain with the nuclear threat they're also putting us under strain with the cyber threat uh, they're in part they're testing us it isn't really these when they go in and they steal information or or, or money i don't think that the main purpose of those attacts is is the theft sort of, uh, you know, to monetize it, but as a yeah. proof of concept. Yeah, a proof of concept. They want to see how good our defenses are. Pro, and uh, most important, they want to see our reaction. Yes. How do we react? Right. Are we going to protect ourselves? Do we have the political will to retaliate? And our reaction is consistently through the Obama administration has been confusion and retreat and then right. doing nothing, you know? That's lack of backbone. Yeah, exactly. Further proof to them of a lack of, uh, of willpower. And uh, uh, you know, and uh, and uh, and uh, a lack of uh, uh, of even knowing what to, uh, yeah. what, what to do that we just don't get it. We don't even know we're under attack. Okay, yes. uh, you know, we have a great debate over whether whether this is warfare or whether it's uh, you know a, na a nation state actor or whether it's being done by some kid in a basement. You know, it's like and, the, the how it was rationalized that terrorism is out core of people not having jobs. Right, and they're so open minded about this, it just defies logic. Yeah, another uh, to go back to what you were talking about about uh, the Chinese and the uh, and, and the Russians. I mean, another false comfort blanket, you know, that Americans cling to uh, in this strategic optimism. This, uh, which is uh, this dysfunctional optimism that affects us, uh, that affects our strategic culture. And it's not just the average American that's affected by this, but it's the people that are supposed to be responsible for our security. People who are supposed to be more realistic, okay, in the Department of Defense and the intelligence community. Uh, you know, I don't blame the average American to, for wanting to sleep well at night, okay? But I, I do blame people who, as professionals, 
uh, you know, engage in these fantasies and they should know better. All right. Yes. And one of these fantasies is this idea that Russia and China we, uh, wouldn't attack us, that we don't have to worry about a global war because their economies depend so much on us. What would they do without the United States? Right. You know, this is the Norman Angela argument from 1910 all over again, you know, and uh, and and. And because of the kind of society we are, the, the business of America is business. And that's true because business, economy, making a good life for your people, we are a materialist society. I mean, in addition to being a spiritual type society, but let's face it, most of the activities and focus of the attention uh, on our society is on living the good life and making money. Yes. And that's the main thing that our society is about. We're a mercantile society. And mercantile societies always think in terms of dollars and cents, but you've got to stand outside of your own civilization and right. see the world from the point of view of other civilizations. China and Russia are not mercantile societies. North Korea and Iran are not mercantile societies. They are very different kind of societies. Uh, you know, <clears throat> Iran uh, has an ideology. Uh, they're not even a nation state, not really. Uh, you know, they're a theocracy that's determined to create a global caliphate you know, that's dedicated to the end time, to bring it on the end time and, and the tr worldwide and universal triumph of Islam in both the, the secular and spiritual universe. That's the object of that nation state. And they're willing to go up and smoke to achieve it. All right. North Korea, with their own concept, they're like a lot like Nazi Germany. They see a special destiny for the Korean people. And that's why they have to conquer and reunite South Korea to bring the blood together the, the, the yes. that, that that superior blood and when they achieve that they'll be ready to catapult themselves up to world That's conquest right. just the way Hitler had this mad mad That's, fantasy you you're bringing a lot of these things and tying them together you know as in the recent past a lot of people think that you know Isis which is a a threat not on this size of scale but it's a regional threat that can strike globally but when we have a superpower that diminishes you know through rhetoric saying that they're junior varsity and what we've talked about and seen through history, whether it's Hitler, Tojo, <clears throat> you know, leaders we now have with ISIS or Kim Jong-un. Yes. When leaders have weapons and they can utterly destroy your society and they currently have the weapons and we know it, it is, it's just like if your neighbor next door had all these weapons parts and he was a fanatic and he'd go out and kill things and he's verbally making marks that he remarks that he's going to kill you. You have to think in a different way than how we have been defensively and think offense. And, you know, we just haven't been there since the Reagan days. Uh, what are, you know, your thoughts on countermeasures to, you know, this, capability that currently today threatens all of America and our way of being. Okay. Just to complete yes. my thought about Russia and China. Yes. Uh, you know, on this idea that, oh, they are, uh, they need us. They need our economy. And therefore they wouldn't attack the United States because, uh, because of this mutual economic independence. You know, if you actually read what the Russians and Chinese write and what they think about that, they don't think they need the United States. You know, they, they have great resentment because they think the United States uh, has been an impediment uh, to their economic prosperity. Uh, they see us as dominating the world economic organizations, institutions. We're preventing them from expanding into territories that they believe historically belong to them. Uh, they think, uh, the Russians think that we're actually penetrating them and committing acts of sabotage, and they really believe that, you know. Uh, it's just a natural thing for totalitarian and authoritarian powers to blame their adversaries for all their problems. You know, they always do that. And so this notion that, oh, we need America, uh, you know, so they're not going to do anything bad to us. They think they'd be a lot better off without America. And besides, a prosperous economy is not their highest prior priority anyway. You know, they're not mercantile societies. They are what you might call national security states or less politely military dictatorships. You know, their highest priority is to stay in power themselves and to have power over others. And they see or don't see the world as a cooperative win-win kind of a situation the way we do. They see it as a zero-sum game. You're either in charge and in yes. control of the whole world, just the way they're in charge of their whole society, yes. or you're dead. And those are the only two choices. And uh, 
Uh, that's why, uh, you know, it's not realistic to think that our uh, the economic relations with Russia and China are going to be a help to us. Uh, what do we have to do? First, we we need to understand. We have to have situational awareness. You know, the people have to wake up and understand what peril we're in, and understand the real world that we actually live in, and not and not live in this fantasy world uh, that, that we're living in right now. You know, where we think China is our friend. Maybe we have some disagreements around the edges with China over North Korea, but ultimately China is our friend and more friendly to us than they are to North Korea, and we can work with them. I mean, how, how many decades have to pass before we learn that that is not true or that Russia can be reasoned with and that Russia, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, is doing what it uh, that maybe that Trump or Obama may have mismanaged Russia, but if we have a smarter person in the Department of State and do things right, you know, we're always blaming ourselves when these relations go go south, and and not uh, willing to just face up to the fact that this uh, a state like Russia has got different interests than we do. Right. Uh, you know, diametrically opposed, as a matter of fact. Irreconcilable. And, yeah, and it's uh, irreconcilable differences, and it's going to act on those uh, 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 on the, those interests. So we need to have a realistic understanding of the geostrategic situation. We've got to stop listening to uh, where where one of my it's more than a pet peeve, but one of the things that's actually going to get us killed is, and it's a civilizational crisis. I think that uh, that there is such ignorance about science and technology among our press and among our policymakers, okay? Uh, we're being very bis badly misinformed about the EMP threat, for example. Uh, uh, journalists, I, I was just talking to one yesterday and just reading the press today, and I'm just so disgusted at how little, they're almost willfully ignorant, okay? Uh, they are. Uh, uh, they have no one, uh, uh, grasp of, of science, of the reality of EMP, of why it needs to be taken seriously, or of cyber warfare for that matter. And um, uh, in a lot of ways, they're like little children. They're so politically biased, the journalists, yes. that uh, uh, you know one of the things that seems to drive the journalist's point of view on EMP is that former Speaker Newt Gingrich takes EMP seriously as a threat. Right. And therefore... Anything that Gingrich believes has got to be wrong and deserves to be mocked and made fun of. Right. And so there's a lot of journalists out there that for no other reason than that won't even let themselves be educated about the science. Yes. They're, they're determined to turn it into some right-wing conservative conspiracy right. that is not a reality, that is ridiculous. As a matter of fact, I actually read a headline yesterday in an article published just yesterday that characterized EMP as ridiculous, right? It's almost like instead of a, a visual blind spot, it's there is a particular category or party of people that they have an audible death spot that whatever it is that's aligned with this line of thinking, they, they just will not hear it. That's and right. And they demote it and they want to think happy thoughts and like things on other people's Facebook or put emojis. They, they want to feel good that this this will go away if they stop thinking about it. But it is, as you stated, it's it's real and it's a real threat today that's being, that's not only capable, it's in the hands of somebody who is voiced, you know, who's, who's actively, you know, saying he's going to destroy the United States and, you know, using the rhetoric that, you know, he's going to put us into rubble, uh, which he... He can do. Yeah, it's in the military doctrines of Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. All of them, if you look at their military, and, and there are open source military and technology writings and science writings on EMP by all of these actors. We're the only ones that belittle EMP or have a problem understanding that, it, that, it, that it's real. They understand it. Not only do they understand it's real, they've weaponized it, and they're ready to use it. It's already incorporated in their war plans. Yes. We're exactly where... You know, Winston Churchill and Neville Chamberlain were back in 1939, yes. okay, facing the Blitzkrieg, and you had fools in, in the British press yes. laughing at the idea that the Churchill's worried about this Blitzkrieg thing and yes. that would never happen. That's not the way the war would be fought. Neville Chamberlain had a phrase that he used, the bomber will always get through, which, which was his short way of saying that mutual assured destruction would work. You know, uh, the next war will be destroyed, destructive of everybody, so there'll not be a war. 
okay? Yes. And, and, and so we're just as blind then. We're repeating the same mistakes. And another problem with the press and with our policymakers, uh, you know, that as a society, we've, uh, we've got this... It's a thought I'm kind of articulating for the first time here, so forgive me if I'm not too, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, if, I, I'm, uh, if I'm groping for the words, but just looking at the press treatment, you know, yes. o- 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 over, the pa- over the past few days, there's a cottage industry that has grown up of, uh, of people who are not experts, not real experts in EMP or nuclear yes. weapons or national security, uh, but they have reputations as being experts. An example is Peter Singer for, from the Brookings Institute, who doesn't have a technical background, but it doesn't stop him from writing books yes. saying that the cyber threat isn't real and the EMP right. th- or being interviewed by the press. He's one of those. It's like that, me being a WebMD. Yeah. Cursory knowledge. Right. Enough to be dangerous and to tickle people's ears. But again, you know, just like we've been mentioning, when people like Osama and Laden, who our intelligence agencies were tracking for in the Horn of Africa for years... You had him when he, when someone like that is threatening us, and I believe we're in this planning phase right now. <clears throat> and I've stated this: I'm, I'm not, you know, lost control of my faculties, but I've stated this for years that I believe that 9/11 was a proof of concept, and that other people besides just jihadists want to see, you know, massive destruction, not just in Washington D.C. and New York, the symbols of. America is a military and financial superpower, but, you know, there's other actors around the world who would love to exploit, but it takes time to organize in order to effectively exploit and and reap the entire opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I believe that, personally, I believe that's where we're at right now, where people have these capabilities. They want to. They are verbally advertising this across the international press, and it's... And they have capabilities with massive amounts of special operations forces in North Korea's their case, to, and their their plans are to you know go after critical infrastructure not just in South Korea but that can be done in phase after an EMP over here in America, and really cripple the United States is you mentioned that can reduce three quarters to ninety percent of our population that is incapable of self sustainment. And uh, basically, our nation is no longer sovereign. Yes, uh, you know, and uh, and and uh, part of our failure to understand it is, is encouraged and misinformed, you know, by this cottage industry of non-experts who posture as experts, and the press is too ignorant. And a lot of our political leaders who are only lawyers, you know, they don't have technical backgrounds, they don't have scientific yes. backgrounds. So we basically got a high-tech science-based society that's necessary to our survival now yes. being run by people who are not high-tech scientific people yes. and being misinformed by other people who really don't know what they're talking about. Yes. But but we've become such a egocentric society that there are actually people who are willing to make a living by going out there. And, and I guess maybe they've convinced themselves that they're real experts, but they have no more, they have no more reason to be talking about EMP or have no more business to be talking about EMP and cyber than they do about brain surgery. It's yes. exactly as if, you know, uh, uh, I think we still have the wit to understand that if you want to understand about brain surgery, you talk to a brain surgeon. Yes. You don't talk to somebody that doesn't know anything about brain surgery, who yes. doesn't have a medical degree, who's never done brain surgery. But that's right. what we're doing in national security. Right. You know, we bring, uh, you know, we uh, depend on the opinions of idiots you know, to advise us. And those opinions, we've also arrived at a point, in a, you know, where we're so, we lack such ability to do critical analysis and thinking things through that there sort of seems to be this, all of our analysis uh, uh, is, is governed by the idea that everybody is entitled to an opinion, okay? Every, but the, fra- the but people have forgotten the notion that all opinions are not of equal merit. Yes. You know, that seems to be forgotten. Don't rely on Oprah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because I see over and over again, you know, the opinion of some idiot yes. ed- elevated to that or given equal weight or even greater weight to that of a real expert. Even and that, in Congress, we've seen, you know, where I remember Oliver North <clears throat> testifying before Congress about 
certain threats, and he was mentioning Osama bin Laden, and again, that's completely discounted, and he was looked at as a kook. And, mm -hmm. you know, here, you know, much later, we had Osama bin Laden who, you know, not just was threatening Oliver North for, you know, what he was directly involved in, but threatening the United States and making good on those promises. And in another Marine in a different era, uh, just before World War II, Major Pete Ellis was sent to look specifically at what the Empire of Japan and Tojo was planning to do all across the Pacific Rim. And he came back and said specifically what was fulfilled. And right now we have yourself as a harbinger who fully understands not just the capabilities of these threats, but how these political parties in various countries and nation states like North Korea have been aligning with each other. They've been arming each other. You know, one of the units that I was with formerly, you know, that we, we were trying to capture ships. We were waiting for them to leave Nanpo, North Korea, because they were supplying missile parts to Syria. And this was right. before the 9-11. You know, and a lot of people in the United States just want to feel good that nothing's going to happen, that, you know, that let's be unbiased about North Korea or Syria, Syria because it's not going to affect me. We don't have that mentality that, you know, when we would do training and exercises, multinational exercises in South Korea, you would have a, there's a different mentality in South Korea because the threat is so close and it's so real. It's the same as if you're in Israel. I mean, yes. You're at belt buckle distance. And when you can actually visually see and you're at foul language distance to your enemy that in, and you have that relation, that's a different mentality that we're not seeing here in America, nor are we taking seriously. That's we? right. We met it. Both of us met a gentleman from Israel yesterday, I yes. believe. You know, and Israel has actually implemented the recommendations of the EMP Commission and is hardening its grid against EMP and cyber threats. So they've derived benefits from the Congressional EMP Commission that our own society hasn't. Yes. And, uh, you know, uh, and, and they're ap operating rationally. But technologically, I mean, the things that we need to do, uh, you know, are, are, are not hard to accomplish. I mean, we've known for 50 years how to harden the grid and our other critical infrastructures from EMP, uh, you know, by using Faraday cages and blocking devices and surge arresters, same kinds of things we use to protect our military systems against this. And if you're protected against the worst threat, a nuclear EMP attack, we'll also protect you against all the lesser threats. EMP from the sun, EMP from non-nuclear weapons. It'll protect you from cyber threats, from physical sabotage, and it'll even mitigate the effects of severe weather like hurricanes and tornadoes. So there's all kinds of reasons aside from EMP not to do it. It wouldn't even be that expensive. You know, uh, the EMP Commission had a plan that would cost about $2 billion, which is what we give away in foreign aid to Pakistan every year. Uh, you know, but the fact that we have not done that the EMP Commission has been trying for 17 years to yes. get Washington to move and to act. The reason for that is symptomatic of a much deeper problem with our civilization. The fact that we are, uh, are from a, uh, a, co a combination of incompetence and corruption and stupidity, and, yes. uh, you know, in, in high places and low. I consider the press to be low places. I consider... You know, the White House to be high places. And unfortunately, even in this White House, you know, yes. there are people surrounding the president that don't want to do anything and nothing is being done. And that's going to get us killed in the end of the day. You know, uh, the technological so solution is cheap and simple. But the reason we haven't implemented it is because of a bigger threat to us that is harder, much harder to solve. I don't know how to solve it. Yeah, it's the system. It's the people yes. that we've become. Uh, and it's a filter that's prevented this information, which we've known about, but it's it has not been getting to the right people who don't want to act in some cases. Yes. Certain administrations. I mean, if Ronald Reagan has known, you know, decades ago and put things in place, which we've reduced. I mean, you know, subsequent presidents have known about this threat. It's been talked to them, whether they spent much time and, and wrap their mind around it. But it's really been left unprepared is right. where we're currently at. If Ronald Reagan were president today and we had the kind of people that we were who had elected Reagan and put him to office, I believe that there'd be no problem and that we would fix this problem in a, in a, in a night blink. And uh, as we were talking about in the beginning of this program, uh, if we were the kind of people 
that had been the great generation that survived the Great Depression and won World War II, and we thought that way still and had that kind of prudence, uh, I think we would immediately solve this problem. It's a, it's, we haven't solved this problem because, uh, you know, because of the kind of people we've become. Oh, there are other reasons, too. The electric power industry doesn't want it. They lobby against it. Uh, you know, there are uh, uh, bureaucratic interests in the Department of Homeland Security and yes. in the national labs. And you can explain all those. But they only get away with that because of the kind of people we've become and the kind of leaders that we elect. Yes. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we're a low-information people now and make, uh, yes. can't make a disting distinction between a brain surgeon and a fraud. Uh, and uh, and this is the most dangerous thing, and this is the thing that can get us killed. Uh, and uh, and this has taken me seventeen years to learn this. You know, uh, is there any current legislation uh, to that the people are able to get behind and become active on to you know make a decision so that we can better protect our, you know our grid right now. There was a, a bill, uh, a, there is a, a law that's already been enacted, uh, and it was enacted uh, in the last possible minute, last December, called the Critical Infrastructure Protection Act. And uh, Ron Johnson deserves credit for that. He was the chairman of the Senate Homeland Security Committee, and, and Mr. McCall, the chairman of the House Homeland Security Committee. And I, mean, I must also mention Congressman Trent Franks. This is really his, yes. his he's the chairman of the, uh, well, he's the uh, co-chair of the uh, Congressional EMP caucus, and and uh, and it was his uh, his uh, genius and his uh, energy that that got that bill passed. And uh, now a, a law is only as good as the people who are going to implement it. Uh, if DA, if the Department of Homeland Security acts on this bill, it can go an enormous way. It can solve this problem for us. You know, it requires the Department of Homeland Security to uh, uh, to develop a plan to protect the country from EMP. Uh, to, to develop a plan uh, in, in conjunction with the utilities to protect the electric grid. It requires them to launch pilot projects in the states, uh, you know, uh, to prove that you can protect the electric grids and to do so cost effectively. And uh, before the EMP Commission went out of business, we actually got a project going in the state of Louisiana. We call it the Louisiana Project. And uh, uh, so there is a bill that's been passed and and. And, and on this bill alone, we could, we could, uh, we could protect the country. You know, uh, so the law is there, legal authorities are there, but a law, again, is only as good as, as the people implementing yes. it. Part of the law, let me tell you a story, because I don't want to leave you on an up note, <laughs> okay, <laughs> with hope that this is going to be solved. Uh, you know, uh, perhaps I should leave you with that, uh, uh, with your <laughs> illusions, but, uh, uh, Part of, the, part of the law was that the Department of Homeland Security was supposed to provide a report to Congress on their progress in implementing, you know, the, uh, the Critical Infrastructure Protection Act by December of this year. And, uh, and, and that's sending a clear signal to the Department of Homeland Security that Congress is serious about the Critical Infrastructure Protection Act, that they want it implemented. They're not just going to pass it and then trust DHS to implement it. Yes. They're asking for a report. What have you guys done a year later? Okay, uh, and, and and they were supposed to confer with the Congressional EMP Commission in making that report. All right. Uh, uh, you know, I think any any uh, if you think of this opportunity here, here is an opportunity right. to protect our civilization yes. against Should, the greatest threat we've ever faced. Yes. Right? Shouldn't be. Partisan at all? Yeah, it shouldn't just be it's national defense. What what student, you know, of policy, of, of yes. political science, uh, of, of of national security policy, of you know, uh, if they were given an opportunity? I mean, yes. it's a Walter Mitty, Mitty fantasy to be the person to say, "Hey, you know, I'm in the Department of Homeland Security, right? And here's an opportunity. Congress has given me this opportunity. Yes. And to, you know, I mean, when I was a young man, if I was now, if I was in the Department of Homeland Security now. The day after, I'd be, not only be aware of that bill, but the day after it was enacted, when the before the president's signature was dry on the bill, I would I would take that football and run with it and go as far as I could in a year, right, to save our country. That's what I would like like to think. That's what I hoped would happen. I would think. That Let me tell you what actually happened. Would get behind it. Let me tell you what actually happened. Okay. The Department of Homeland Security formed a. Uh, <laughs> 
a DHS EMP task force to write the report to Congress on the progress they've made in implementing the Critical Infrastructure Protection Act in late September of this year, okay, months after the passage of the Critical Infrastructure Protection Act. Uh, and then, uh, two days before the EMP Commission terminated on the 30th of September, uh, they, they asked to have a teleconference with the EMP Commission, two, two days before they teleconferenced. Mind you, uh, I think the only reason they, they did that is because under the law, they had to confer with the EMP Commission. And so they conferred with us as little as they possibly could so they could still check the box. Because a teleconference, okay, on something of this sort, we offered to brief them. Don't you want to see our research? Don't you want to see our solutions? Let us brief you. They didn't want the briefings. Uh, uh, the teleconference, when we actually had the teleconference, they didn't want to have the teleconference with the whole commission. They just wanted to have it with one guy, the chairman of our commission. Okay, so they didn't want to hear from all the commissioners. I had to be invited. Okay, the, the chairman said, well, can I bring Peter Pry with me to the teleconference? Right. All right. And they reluctantly agreed that I would participate. Uh, when we got them on the phone, we wanted to know, well, who's on this DHS EMP task force? Who are we talking to? They wouldn't tell us. Okay, they remained anonymous. I knew one guy because I recognized his voice. And right. so he admitted who he was. And I knew all these people are Obama administration holdovers, okay, who have been obstructing progress on EMP right. uh, for years. And they are in charge of the DHS EMP task force, okay? The one guy, the one, there's a team in EMP that's really good. In fact, uh, Ronald Reagan had, had had they used to work in the White House under uh, they, their team was stood up by Ronald Reagan. It's called the National Communication System because Reagan understood that EMP was a threat and he wanted to protect the White House and all the executive yes. level, and so he had the NCS stood up. And then when Obama came along, he didn't like the idea of these nuclear EMP guys being in the White House, so he signed, wrote an executive order that shipped them over to the Department of Homeland Security where they have been isolated and fighting the Battle of the Alamo, having their budget and personnel cut all the, all those years. And But they're the best people on EMP in the department, and they're not on the EMP DHS task force. They didn't even know about it. I'm going to get all kinds of people in trouble telling you this. It's not classified, but I, I might as well tell the American people, yes. this is this is where we are. This is sort of the status of where we are as of, it's almost Halloween now. Now, this these things happened about a month ago. So this is, Pretty current update about the status of EMP preparedness in America, effective the end of September 2017 yes. and the year of our Lord 2017, you know, and under under President Trump, unfortunately, you know, yes. and, uh, uh, you know, Mr. President, Mr. President drained the swamp at the Department of Homeland Security. you got to fire these guys and bring in a, and bring in a new team. That's what you've got to do, Mr. President. Please do it. And if you're able to talk to the. The people here, uh, this legislation it has passed. Yes. Where should they aim those calls, those letters, those emails to their congressional representatives and senators, to their members of Congress, to specifically reinforce? You said Trent Franks, and, and what actions would you say that they need to address to their members of Congress and their representatives? I I would say. Uh, 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 you know, continue the original EMP commission. I mean, another thing we haven't even talked about at length, okay, another really bad thing and that has gotten me uh, uh, in such despair, okay, because there's been another development that's happened. And that is, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, so maybe it's redundant. Uh, I don't think I did. Uh, but uh, the EMP commission itself is terminated, effective the 30th of September. I said... We had that teleconference two days, two or three days before the EMP commission went out of business. Well, we, we terminated on the 30th of September. Mm. No one in the Department of Homeland Security or the Department of Defense asked to continue the commission. You know, we were allowed to, to go out of business. And it's worse than that. Uh, 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 you know, we then became aware uh, that there's plans afoot by the Republican Congress, okay, in the House Armed Services Committee specifically, uh, you know, to establish a new EMP commission with new commissioners, to appoint new commissioners. We already have the best team in America on this stuff. And the commissioners are to be appointed half by Democrats and half by Republicans. You know, and uh, 
you know, we're very concerned. You know, although I respect our representatives, they are lawyers. You know, this is this is like uh, select expecting six Democrats and six Republicans to choose the people that are going to do brain surgery, okay, for your, you know, for your children, right? And, uh, and, uh, and in fact, it's even more important than that, because uh, uh, in the case of our children, there's only a few people involved, but 320 million Americans' lives depend on the right people being cho chosen for that commission. Yes. And we already have the best people on the existing yes. EMP commission. It takes away from being a meritocracy and having the proven experiences and leadership to becoming a political appointee much like these ambassadors that are not experts in anything. They are just there because of yes. somebody granted them that, like the grace of God, has gifted these people this ability instead of knowing what they're supposed to is, in your case, how can they properly advise the people in such a, 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 on a matter that's such of critical importance to us? Well, I, and, and also, I, I, uh, you know, I think you can know the new EMP commissioners by the enemies of the old EMP commission, okay? Yes. And the enemies of the old EMP commission are Obama holdovers in the Department of Defense and executives in the electric power industry, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. Both of them hate the existing EMP commission. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, NERC has got deep pockets, lots of money to spread around. God knows why Obama holdovers would, it, it would have such influence on the Republican Congress. But they do. And um, and so I fear the new uh, new commission is going to be basically the Obama administration version of an EMP commission. Yes. And I wouldn't be surprised for the uh, that, that it'll be uh, staffed with non-experts uh, and uh, propagandists and uh, and lobbyists for the electric power industry and anti-nuclear nuts who are going to come in and say, "Go back to sleep." Uh, you know, EMP isn't really as bad a threat, or it's such a complicated issue. It really requires a lot more study before we do anything. And, uh, and in fact, that's actually what the plan of the Obama administration was. The Obama administration never said that EMP wasn't a threat, but rather they needed to study it. And their plan, and it's still the, the plan, was to continue to have the national labs study EMP out to the year 2020 and beyond. So, uh, and the, the longer you study it, and the, yeah, and the NERC, the, the electric power industry is willing to pay for that. They're willing to give millions to the national labs to keep studying the problem so they don't have to do anything. Make a decision. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that's how uh, we, we work. So these are all very, uh, it's hard for me to be inspirational and give you a positive, upbeat ending to this with that's these what, terrible developments. Uh, but that's the, where we are. The first person that comes on and says anything besides the naked truth, it's their last time. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> so, but that's the truth of where we are. Now, we're not giving up. I mean, uh, you know, I still have this, maybe I shouldn't even tell you because when they find out about it, they'll, they'll try to kill it, okay? But we still have this uh, uh, EMP task force on national and homeland security. It's, uh, it's a congressional advisory board. It's an unfunded congressional advisory board. We have no money, we have no resources, we have no power, but we're officially a congressional advisory board. You know, we work for the EMP yes. caucus, for, for, for Mr. Franks. Uh, most of the EMP commissioners and staff belong on it. And all of us have been doing this. Uh, you know, we work largely pro bono anyway. Right. Uh, okay. And we've been doing this for our grandchildren, for, the, yes. for, for, for national security. And so we're not going to give up. You know, in fact, the motto of the EMP commission is Winston Churchill's motto. Uh, it's from a plaque in Dr. Graham, the chairman of the EMP commission's office. Uh, never, 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 right. never give up. And we will never give up. And uh, even though, uh, you know, a congressional commission has enormous stature and power and uh, uh, versus a congressional advisory board, it's like one of the lowest life forms on Capitol Hill. So we've been we're moving from a battleship uh, or an aircraft carrier yes. in, in, into a destroyer. OK, right. or maybe even a torpedo boat. But. As long as we've got a torpedo to fire a cannon that we can fire, we're going to keep firing it. So maybe that'll be the upbeat thing. We're never, yes. never, never going to give up. We're going to continue fighting. And uh, and uh, I think, I hope, I think that a lot of the American people are still capable of thinking critically, are still capable of logic, yes. are still open to the facts. The fact that Donald Trump was elected president is, yes. gives me great hope. 
because that people can only be lied to for so long. Yes. And they can see, you know, when the job isn't getting done and right. when they're being lied to and when yes. and when the ba- when 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 people need to be fired, you yes. know. And so uh and and so uh uh I hope perhaps our efforts uh you know, despite the fact that we're going to be up against a battleship or an aircraft carrier, uh, you know, it will I imagine it will be a ship of fools. <laughs> and so yes. I expect we I have high hopes that we will win because we're trying to convince an American people, that part of the American people, uh, that still care about the facts and can still think logically. Yes. And we've been winning all along. It's been a David versus Goliath battle all along. I mean, yes. you know, it's only been a handful of us, you know, fighting against the electric power industry and the liberals and the press yes. and the bureaucrats and the Obama administration who do on anything. And against all that, we've been winning the war. We've won. We've lost this 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 battle recently, uh, you know. But uh, you know. But uh, I I still have high hopes that we will win the war uh, because of the American people. Some silver linings, and a lot of it has become what I had experienced in our case with fake news launched at us, <clears throat> and that's why so many people are turning to podcasting because they're tired of hearing the same Donald Trump and the Russians. It's same drone monotone stuff in the mainstream media, but those that listen and, you know, all across the country, this isn't a local audience, you know, are able to, you know, the, the silver linings I think is not just when it comes time to vote, like it is in 2018 coming up here as people are getting organized right now for that uh, process. But those who have been ignoring this is for accountability. Those people who are listening to this can contact your congressional representative to reinforce this effort, can buy Dr. Pry's book, and we'll, on the website, if you're watching this on YouTube, we'll put that up so that you can order that through Amazon, which also supports the, the show. But uh, you can get yourself educated specifically more on what he's been saying by reading the book contacting your representative and he's he has this little badge here oh yes of a, a colleague that he has worked with for a number of years and she has over 38 years of experience not just in the national security administration but she herself is running for office in pennsylvania the senate she's running yes. for the senate in the state of pennsylvania Cindy Ayers, Professor Cindy Ayers of the formerly of the U.S. Army War College, 38-year veteran of the National Security Agency, my deputy on the uh, on the EMP task force, a true American hero. I mean, she's been one of us, but that's been waging this David versus versus Goliath battle, and and Pennsylvania actually, I mean, this is just serendipity or the hand of hand of God, you know, it happens to be the most important state in the United States for protecting the United States from EMP because there's more EHV transformers in Pennsylvania than any other state. And its location in the grid, it's, it's literally the keystone state of the electric grid. So if we could get the state of Pennsylvania protected, yes. you know, it would be an enormous step forward toward being able to protect the eastern grid yes. and therefore the entirety of the United States. So she happens to live in the right state at the right time yes. and, uh, and uh, is uh, throwing her hat into the ring she never wanted to be a politician. I hate politics too. That's not what we what, what, what we do. She but, doesn't need to do it. Yeah, and she doesn't season. need to do it. And uh, you know, but but she's doing it just the same reason yes. the EMP task force is going to go to and be a destroyer or a patrol yes. torpedo boat doing battle against the, the aircraft carrier, and we will yes. win. We will sink them. And like you had mentioned, she is not just a another expert, but she is on the EMP task force, and I heard her speak yesterday at the National Security Conference, she truly has in a very inside approach and an in-depth knowledge on this particular threat to America, which is a threat to everybody. If if it's poo-pooed by the press or certain politicians, you have to understand their incentives in that. But here's two people, both Cindy Ayers and Dr. Pry, that, that know this threat, that have no incentives. There's nothing. He, he's an unpaid you know, working pro bono on this right now because he knows the threat, like he mentioned to his grandkids. 
there's no incentive for myself. Although for years and years, both in uniform and after retirement, I continue to tell people about why are we spending so much time and resources with American lives and material resources in wars which threaten America, but not on this global scale uh, that can see our civilization in America cease to exist. So I encourage everybody on the show to get active, get active in your knowledge, uh, purchasing Dr. Prize book, uh, as well as contacting your congressman and those who live in Pennsylvania, the entire state is able to elect a highly intelligent and qualified fighter who knows the threat and who will d- take those actions to protect ourselves. Let me make a couple of other suggestions. You know, uh, tell your congressman and your senator to join the Congressional EMP Caucus. There's no excuse for them to at least not sign up and join yes. the, the caucus so that they start getting educated about the threat and know uh, what to do. The uh, Congressional EMP Caucus, it's a bipartisan caucus. It's co-chaired by Representative Trent Franks, who's the Republican, and Yvette Clark, who's the Democrat from New York City. You know, so here's a rare case where you've got a Democrat Conservative, Demo- uh, conservative Republican and liberal Democrat working yes. together against the EMP threat. Uh, I would I would write tr- President Trump, email President Trump any way Tweet you him. can get a message to President yes. Trump. Tweet President Trump to let him know you care about this threat. You want the country protected against the EMP. Um, uh, if you've got a way of 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 uh, of, of sending a, a message to uh, any one else in the administration, yes. I, I, you know, I, I, I do that too. Yes. And there's hundreds of thousands of Americans when, when we get this message out, hundreds of thousands of people listen to this and so many Americans are now on social media and some people think that drives president Trump crazy. But if you really want to change, whether you're on one side of the fence or not, you know, America is a democracy. That's the majority. And it really takes, because president Trump doesn't listen to every email people tally what the subject is and on what side it is. So contacting anybody can instantly sign up for a Twitter account, push this information, which you've, you've heard today from Dr. Pry, become more educated through his book and contact president Trump. You can do it today and voice your concerns for your, your family and your extended family on what we are currently threatened. There's no, no incentive, served my country for nearly 27 years in uniform and I wouldn't be here talking about this threat if it was not a viable threat that threatens every single American's life. So if you love your family, you need to become more aware of this issue and take action, which you can do, like I said, so simply, you know, through Twitter, those, those numbers make a difference. And that gets, you know, into how the president turns his ear and understands something needs to be done as well as take action with your member of Congress. And let me add that uh, this should certainly not come as a surprise to the president, to your member of Congress or, or the Senate, because it's right in the Republican Party platform that President Trump ran on, that, every, uh, that, and that every member of the House and the Senate were elected on. It's the Republican Party platform that we're supposed to protect this country against the EMP threat. I know that because I wrote the language for the Republican Party platform. So it's right in there. It's their jobs. They're supposed to do it. It's not supposed to be endlessly studied. Uh, you know, the time to, for debate is over. You know, a decision had already been made, and we elected these people yes. to do this job. Yes. Any any safe rounds or parting thoughts, Brian? Well, I would also say that uh, uh, while you should certainly – Reach out to your representatives in Washington and do what you can through Washington. Don't neglect the state either. My book, Blackout Wars, is basically a handbook that describes how you can protect your state. Even if your state is part of a larger regional grid, and most states are, If you you can protect this uh, your state grid so the lights would stay on in your state, even if they went down in the rest of America. And this could be accomplished by executive order by a governor of a state. He could write, sign an executive order ordering the utilities to protect the grid. In the book, there's a blank executive order already written out. All the governor has to do is sign his name and sign the name of his state, and he can get the grid protected. There's a blank legislative thing. If you're a member of, the, of, of a state 
Senate or a state house, you know, you could take that bill. There's a bill for getting your state grid protected in that book. And last, let's not forget personal preparedness. We've been talking a lot about the great generation here. And one of the things that's different about the great generation that lived through well, World War II and survived the Great Depression is, uh, is today we would call them survivalists, which is sort of a derogatory term preppers. sometimes, or, or, or preppers. Nope, Everybody nope. was a prepper or survivalist who lived through the Great Depression and World yes. War II. The ration. And that was a good thing. You know, those were, they had the virtues of rugged individualism and self-sufficiency that made America great and free. Our constitutional republic was designed for people of that character, of that mentality. And in a generation or two, I find it very alarming that those principles of rugged individualism and self-sufficiency have been lost. Now everybody looks to Washington for solutions. They expect to be rescued from hurricanes and tornadoes in 72 hours by the uh, uh, by FEMA, you know, even though FEMA is never there in 72 hours, even though it right. promises to be there, it's never there. Look at Puerto Rico today and what a disaster that is, you know. Uh, you know, we've got the... And that's like a small case study. It's a what, small case study. What of the, could happen across the The nation. combined forces of the entire U.S. emergency community are, are concentrating on Puerto Rico and people still fear for their lives. And if both so don't, parties were blaming the president for not taking action, which I, I think that's a fake news. It story. is fake news. What should be known is then then why aren't we do if If we're so concerned about Puerto Rico, not even an actual U.S. state... What about the entire 50 actual states and everybody that lives in there? Why aren't we doing something that would prevent something, a natural act of God? Right. Or an attack from, you know, one of our sworn enemies. Puerto Rico proves that if there was a nationwide blackout, the kinds of thing we've been talking about, that would be toast. You know, we yeah. can't even rescue the little island of Puerto Rico with a maximum uh, with a maximum effort. I mean, we will eventually rescue it. There won't be mass starvation. People won't die of pandemics. Yes. But people are, but the problem is not solved yet. Weeks after the blackout, and people are rightly fearing for their lives. So, uh, so be prepared yourself. You know, start building a stockpile of food. You should water. aim for getting at least a, a, a six months to a year's worth of food, uh, a water supply, or know how to get fresh water. Have a plan for survival in a protracted blackout situation. Yes. Have a medicine kit and know how to use it. Think about what kind of neighborhood you're living in and whether it would be safe in the in the aftermath of yes. one of these scenarios we're talking about. Do you have friends or relatives who live in the country? If so, maybe you should get together and, and, and have a plan with them. Uh, and uh, and this, I'm not asking you to live in fear. My parents, who were prepared for anything, didn't live in fear. I think it will. you'll find that it will make you happier at the end of the day yes. to have the confidence and comfort of knowing that you can provide for yourself and that you're maybe even able to help your neighbor if an emergency yes. situation comes up. You know, I, I think it's a, uh, a much more satisfying life that one can lead, knowing that you're prepared for anything than living a life of, of foolhardy insecurity yes. where... Uh, you know, where one lives in this fantasy world we've been talking about. Yes. And, uh, and, and in order to sleep comfortably at, not, at, at night, one clings to a false security blanket. But at the back of your mind, you know you're going to be in trouble if any of these things happen. That's no way to live. That's not a mature, grown-up way to live. Right. Live the way your parents and grandparents did and be prepared. It's interesting how... A lot of people talk, but then they don't put anything actually down into planning and actually going out and buying, you know, stockpiling provisions as our, as our family had. And they also, you know, about cash and currency and how they're, you know, you know, in testing like we do in the military, you're actually going out in the field and in training to that and living lights off, you know, through different environmental cycles that we have throughout the year to actually see if your family... This is something that I believe is is a, the wave of the future. It's just a reality that we're going to deal with, hopefully. But we can't, you know, count on just hope. I mean, an act of God can create this. And are we prepared to to live and survive for however long it may be? Uh, with, you know, when some people have an app on their phone and they can't text, and they got to go back into the, the they lose their mind. Um, you know, businesses, if they can't have a telecommunication conference with one party, it's, 
it's a strategic loss in some cases. So this is a this is a reality that will, you know, need to be dealt with down at the very personal and individual family level. So, um, Dr. Pry, thank you again. Is do you have anything else to, uh, you want to add? Thank you for your heroic service in the military, sir, and thank you for becoming part of the solution by having, uh, you know, a, a, an in-depth discussion. It's rare that one has a uh, the privilege and opportunity to talk to somebody who has uh, uh, served as you have and uh, and has all the right uh, instincts, you know, about uh, uh, you know about what our national security needs and the perilous situation that our that our country faces right now. It's a, uh, you know it's an honor to be on your show. It's it's a privilege and thank you for all your years of study and research and being the voice that's out there, being a true harbinger. Um, just like in the reconnaissance community, we're going out there taking a lot of risks going behind enemy lines to find out. And that's what you have done strategically for our entire nation, not uh, you know for a larger Marine force. He's doing this for the United States of America. And currently, you know, without the incentive of pay, and usually as on the show, we're talking about health and overcoming adversity. And hopefully this is something that can be prevented or mitigated to where we don't have to overcome massive adversities on a, on a nationwide scale. And I wouldn't be talking about this. It's just like health. I mean, hopefully we can prevent this and it takes, you know, the third topic on our show that we love to talk about is, is leadership, leadership of every single person becoming active, not fearful, but having that concern that drives you to action to read, understand the subject matter more, and then to engage on a on a level that's going to actually have, you know, a, achieve accomplishments, a goal, and that is to that we protect ourselves, our family, and our state, as he had recommended, and nationally. So, but thank you very much again, Dr. Pry. Thank you. It. Thank you so much. To all my fellow grunts out there who in your youth felt it was your duty to protect us, I salute you. And thanks to the listeners of the Go Commando Show who labor on the farm, who are sweating on the construction site, putting forth your very best at the office, you are making a difference. Support the Go Commando Show in our pursuit of bringing you the highest quality professionals. Infiltrate the website at gocommandoshow.com where you can view all of the podcasts and arm your team with incredible deals on health supplements, commando clothing, and equipment. Every time that you get a good deal, it supports the show. What deals? When you purchase anything from the website, Amazon, healthcare supplements, you're covering our six. And to the ladies on the team, when you outfit yourself in the super sexy threads from Naked Zebra, and yes, I'm talking about in a fuego. You are firing the sniper shot for our commandos. How else can you support? It's simple. You smash the follow and subscribe buttons on our social media. That is how you support us bringing great guests to talk about serious subjects, not the mainstream media's fake news. So thank you. And until our next show, stay in the attack and go commando. Come